go to our scripture now, which comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, in the first three verses. Before we read, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word that you have given to us as we read it this day. We ask that you would bless it to our understanding and ask that you would help us to be doers as well as hearers of it, to understand your word and to be thankful for it. In the name of Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Luke 13, verses 1 through 3. Just at that time, some people came who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus replied to them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they have suffered in this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. There was a man that saw his friend sitting on a bench outside of the store. He realized his friend had been at work, so he walked up to him and, and he said, uh, Ben, he said, you should be at work. He said, what's wrong? He said, my memory's gotten so bad, he said, I finally just lost my job. And he said, you mean they fired you over it? He goes, no, I'm still employed. I just don't know where. <laughs> we all have spotty memories, I guess, as we grow older. Uh, hopefully our memories don't grow that bad. But uh, regardless of what we remember or what we forget, there are some things that we always remember. You know, moments that will always be ingrained on our mind. People who were alive when JFK was shot say they can remember where they were when they heard of that event, even though it happened over 50 years ago now. And then, of course, those of us who were alive on September the 11th, 2001, will always remember where we were, uh, even though that event happened 20 years ago yesterday. And, of course, if you've watched any television at all for the past few days, you can see it's been uh, one big remembrance there. In our faith, we're often called to remember. You see that in Scripture a lot. God calls on us to remember. And remembering is a tool that is used for us to realize the lessons that we have learned from things. In Exodus, for example, the Hebrews are instructed by God to always remember the Passover. That time when they were redeemed from slavery and death and, and out of Egypt and given their freedom. And in remembering that, they remembered, of course, who their God was, uh, who they are in their God, and that this God loved them and sought in his power to save them. So we might ask ourselves, then, what is it that we learn from 9-11 as we remember that day? And of course, there are endless lessons that we can learn from that day. You know, there are no doubt uh, political lessons, military lessons, and economic lessons, all sorts of which, uh, you know, most of them are outside the purview of, of what I do here. Uh, but here in the House of Faith, we might ask ourselves, what spiritual lessons uh, can we learn from 9-11? And so I want to discuss just three. We can, of course, have endless lessons there as well. Just three lessons that we learned from thinking about remembering 9-11. And I want to look at that looking through today's scripture as a lens. In today's scripture, uh, Jesus is told by a group of people about some Galileans who were worshiping. And even as they worshiped, they were slaughtered by Roman troops. It says that their blood was mixed with the blood of their sacrifices. So even as they were making sacrifices to God, worshiping God, their own blood was shed by the Romans. Such would have been seen, of course, as the most horrible sacrilege of the worst sort. We might ask ourselves, why did the Romans do that? We don't know. No more specifics are given. Perhaps the Romans perceived of them rightly or wrongly as a threat. Maybe the Romans saw them rightly or wrongly as rebels against Rome. The Romans were wont to act against any such perceived threat uh, drastically and quickly. Uh, they usually killed first and asked questions later if they asked questions at all. But we don't really know. But we might ask ourselves too, why did these people bring this up to Jesus? And again, we don't know. It doesn't say. Perhaps they were perplexed. Maybe they were questioning, saying, why did this happen? Why did God allow people to be slaughtered while they were worshiping him? And this question, in its general expression, I guess you could say is the question of the ages. Why do bad things happen? Why does God allow bad things to happen? And 
it's a question that we often don't have direct answers for. The whole book of Job is dedicated to the question of why is this happening? Why do bad things happen? And in the end, the answer that Job got was, I'm God and you're not. So it wasn't really a direct answer uh, that Job might have been seeking. But we humans still yet come up with answers of our own, and sometimes those answers are wrong. Uh, some people with the thought of this Galilean situation may have thought, like one of Job's friends thought, that they suffered that because they deserved it. Bad things happen to people because they've done something bad to deserve it. And maybe there were some around Jesus who were thinking or maybe even saying the same thing. But Jesus answers in a different direction. He says, do you think this happened to these Galileans because they were worse than all the other Galileans? He goes, no. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish like they did. So while Jesus doesn't give a direct answer as to why this happened, he does turn away the answer that they deserved it somehow. Jesus goes on immediately in verses after this to talk about a tower in Siloam that fell over and crushed some people there. And he said, were these people worse than all others that this tower fell over on them? And he says the same thing again, no. You know, unless you repent, you all will likewise perish. So the lessons that we can learn from this this morning, first and foremost, uh, is a lesson we all know. And it's a lesson we learned from 9-11, and that is that life is uncertain. Life is, in fact, far from certain. It is vastly unpredictable. Sometimes there is cause and effect, but often we can't even make those connections. We never know what a day will bring. We all go about our business just as we always have, and sometimes we're shocked about what happens, things we didn't expect. Sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're not so good. And we see this in the Scripture. The Galileans, no doubt, did not expect to be slaughtered that day. And the people in the shadow of the Tower of Siloam certainly didn't expect that the tower would fall over on them. These were uncertain events that came upon them. The people in the Twin Towers and in the Pentagon were just going to work, an ordinary day like any other. And the people on the airplanes were just traveling, as many of them no doubt had done many times before, another ordinary day. They could not have expected the things that happened that day. But life is uncertain. And sometimes the tragically unexpected happens, and it is shocking to us. No doubt the Galileans were just as shocked by what happened to them as we were shocked by what happened on 9-11. The second thing that we can learn is that evil is real. It exists. The Romans did the evils, did evil's bidding uh, when they slaughtered the Galileans as they worshipped God. And the terrorist hijackers did evil's bidding when they killed nearly 3,000 people on 9-11. Evil comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes and conditions, and sometimes it'll co-opt most any ideology or religion or belief to cover itself and give an excuse for what it does. But evil is evil, whether it claims God's name as its own for its reason or not. Evil's purpose, as Scripture tells us, is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so the third thing that we can learn is the most important thing. And what we can learn is that God is there even in the midst of the suffering and that God offers healing, salvation, and hope even in and especially in those times. God is good. Jesus emphasizes this in what he says. He doesn't answer the question as to why these things happen to the Galileans or the people that the tower fell on. He simply tells them to repent. And what he is saying there is that, you know, your time's not yet. The door is still open. There is still hope there. God is looking for you to turn to him. And so it is an opportunity. God is there. God is seeking to save. So we know that, uh, you know, the third thing we can learn is that God is present. We may not know why something happens. And we may not know why God allows evil to exist or why God allows it to act a certain way in certain situations. But we can know that God, despite it all, is still good, is still loving, is still merciful, and is still concerned with us. God does not cause evil, the scripture tells us, but he will, in the end, defeat evil. God does not further evil's purposes, but God stands with those that evil strikes at. And he takes their hands and he wraps his arms around them. 
We read in Scripture that the Lord suffers with us, even as he suffered for us on the cross. The same Romans who slaughtered the Galileans crucified Jesus. Jesus suffered and died that we might be forgiven of our sin. But he also suffered in that circumstance to show that he suffers both with us and for us. He stands with us in those dire times. And in those times, he gives us not only the love and strength and support that we need, but he gives us the hope that we need, the ultimate answer that defeats both uncertainty and evil. Not hope is the way we often mean it. Sometimes when we say hope, we don't think something's going to happen. You, know, you say, well, maybe this will happen. Well, I hope so. And by that, I mean, you know, 50 50 chance, roll the dice, it might happen, but I doubt it. <laughs> but that's not what I mean here by hope. Hope, in a scriptural sense, is a certain thing. It is something that has not happened yet, but God has promised it will. And so it is a certain hope we have in a God who is completely and utterly trustworthy and who will keep his word and promises. And that certain hope and faith that we have tells us that of these three lessons, that life is uncertain, that evil exists, and that God is good, that only one of these will exist eternally, and that is that God is good. In the end, uncertainty will be ended, and evil will be defeated, and the God who loves us will be the one standing victor in the end, not evil. And so as we remember the somber lessons of 9-11 some 20 years on now, let us not forget the certainty of the lessons of faith that we learned as well. That our hope and faith in the God who loves us will not go unanswered, but will see us through, through in strength until that day when evil no more casts its shadow among us. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you have defeated evil. Oft times it seems so strong. It seems as if it will smother us. But Lord, you have defeated evil, and one day it will be put underfoot forever. Of all the things that it brings and all the suffering that it causes. Help us, Lord, to live in the good, to live in your blessings, to be the overcomer sung about in the song that we can be through you. Help us, Lord, to hold that faith in our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.